What a time to be mentally unwell and angry at video games. Distrust in the industry and disparate political player bases has led to the moment when a wholly unremarkable game like Stellar Blade has brought us to a crossroads where it's either a peak example of patriarchal male gazing or a brave protest purchase against puritanical scorn from people who find games too tacky and male dominated. I can't exactly begin this video as sanctimonious as I would like. It's undeniable that the video game industry has treated fan service like some unpleasant acknowledgement of the medium's past that we had supposedly moved on from into a glorious, safe, horny age, where sex appeal can be acknowledged within brackets that can fit about three letters worth of porn tags. So witnessing a new AAA game embrace objectification in such a way is so startlingly compelling that I can't help but be a little impressed. Outside of niche anime games and weekly Steam releases full of unanimated Uncanny Valley inhabitants, this kind of character design doesn't have happen often in big budget titles. I'm still going to make fun of it, because if a game throws TNA in my face, yet fails to stir anything but amusement, the only response left is a point and laugh at the audacity, the misfire, and the desperation. Sadly, discussing the game's sex appeal will occupy more time than I'd prefer because, aside from a combat system that's actually quite good, Stellar Blade offers little else of substance. A woman's center of gravity is in her hips and Stellar Blade's protagonist certainly has a lot of gravity, but not enough to keep the lighter-than-helium narrative from drifting away from it, caught in a three-body problem. A snow globe's retelling of near Automata's philosophical ideas, visually compelling for a few moments after you shake it, but then settling into dullness once the glitter pulls at the bottom. Characters who are essentially mannequins with gray haircuts and designer clothes, but possess personalities about as deep as a coffee stain on my desk. Noticeable but easily overlooked and quickly wiped away, all contained in a world that relies on the Bible to make up for the shallowness of its lore. Dropping Old Testament names so often, the game feels like a ploy to coax weebs into going to church. By the time you're halfway through, you might just feel guilty enough to consider Sunday service, if only to pray for a deeper melding of narrative and character design. You see, I'm perfectly fine with games being filled with attractive women, even ones wearing outfits if it is snugly as a condom. But the personalities, setting and narrative have to match the ridiculousness of such characters. When that setting is a biblically themed post-apocalypse where beautiful space women fight grotesque monsters with swords, you've already stylized the world and characters to a degree that I can't possibly connect with, so you may as well lean into it and make it comfortably absurd. But with a serious as this cast possess, you'd think you were playing a Last of Us mod where all the characters were replaced with Instagram models. Larger-than-life looks demand larger-than-life activities and personalities, because why else would you get up at 5 in the morning to comb your meter-long ponytail and have your makeup team spend 3 hours getting your face looking perfect? Stellar Blade begins with the forces of the OnlyFans space colony launching an attack on Earth to find and destroy the Elder Nativa, but it's cut short when all their ships are destroyed in the Nativa's opening salvo. Only one ship managed to drop its pods, which constitutes the colony's sole plan. Deploy attractive women with no equipment or resources to the service in order to genocide their enemies. Sexily. It's a Miss America winner's idea of warfare. I told myself I would eventually be given an explanation for why Mother Sphere only recruits attractive women for war. I'm still waiting on that one even after finishing the game. Tacky is more than Eve's friend. It's also a perfect description of the game. In time, and with a whole lot of cultural propaganda, this is what people will believe Normandy was actually like one day. This game loves being anachronistic with the weirdest of things, like making their first day look like old school amples. An entire spaceship crashes a few meters away from them, and all it does is knock them back a few feet. With how badly this assault is gone, it should demand some reflection on the planning the Mother Sphere put into this, or lack thereof, since it's resulted in the needless death of the entire 7th Airborne Squadron. But Eve will never once stop to think about how their lives were callously thrown away. We haven't completed our mission. Now it's just up to us to see this mission through. Is there no option to retreat after a failure like this? At least give me a do-or-die situation, something like the Elder Nativa is going to destroy the world or the colony. But there isn't. There's no pressing need that I could find for this suicide mission. This isn't even the first time an airborne squadron has been destroyed in this way. They do this regularly. If a ship landing in that Nativa didn't kill it, I don't think swords will. Combat is handled surprisingly well for a game developed by a studio that has previously only made mobile gotcha games. It relies heavily on Sekiro's accomplishments, requiring you to parry incoming hits along with color-coded special enemy attacks that have to be countered in specific ways, draining your opponent's stamina all the while, which once depleted allows you to pull off an execution-style move which either kills them outright or does significant damage. It feels like a rhythm game missing the soundtrack at times, especially later when it also wants you to focus on dodging just as much as parrying, but it worked well enough for me to come to terms with it and never felt like there was a wasted mechanic. Other parts of FromSoft's formula were cut out. You don't have to backtrack to the spot you died at to retrieve experience points, because the RPG element of the game is pretty bare, offering skill trees and some gear crafting for stat boosts. I'm more surprised they didn't take the opportunity to have you run back to the point of your death to retrieve your clothes, because Eve does have a skin suit that leaves her weaker with no shields, and that would have been a pretty imaginative way of subverting FromSoft's standard. 
Taki's looks have been sculpted to such a high degree that she's incapable of displaying a pained expression on her face after her arm was cut off and then she was impaled on the raven nativist claw. She may not look it, but that girl is in endless pain. Sexily. In the next scene, Eve is being flown around by Adam who saved her from the raven nativa with his hoverbike. He then whisks her off to a location where she can find an alpha nativa. An entire partnership happened in one jump cut. God created a less abrupt team up when he made Eve from Adam's rib. And this is the same divine being who said let there be light before he even made the first stars. I'm sure most of Eve's outfit is uncomfortable to wear, but those heels look like a torture device. Something is falling from the sky. A strange sensation. I'm not too surprised that Eve is ignorant of rain or falling water. Her clothes fit tight enough to convince me she probably prefers drying off after a bath with a garbage bag. The one thing every single Souls-like fails at replicating is level design. The devs know they have to create shortcuts that circle back to other areas you pass through to allow access to checkpoints, which in a FromSoft game means unlocking doors, knocking over a tree, or activating a lift, among other things. Stellar Blade just plops a chain link fence down in your path and demands you circle around a mountain so you can use the slide bolt. The only other barriers are locked doors that require you to scan for dead people nearby who have the access code on them. Weirdly, all the door codes are written in Greek numerals for some reason, or collecting fusion batteries to power up terminals. The game isn't even hard enough to warrant this type of design. It never felt like I was struggling to make progress in the next shortcut. They're pretty frequent, and dying lacks any penalty. I don't find Eve's character design to be that impressive, at least in comparison to other female characters in the game. She possesses that focus-tested attractiveness. Pretty, but forgettable. The most interesting thing about her design is that her sword also serves as a hair clip when not in use. Though if it ever turns on accidentally, she's gonna have a sword sticking through her brain. The previous airborne squadrons brought soda machines, payphones, and vinyl record players with them to create supply camps, which you activate using cryptocurrency. The only thing they brought that makes sense is the big pot of stew, of which Eve never eats. I would make fun of this ridiculous military glamping, but it's more preparedness than Eve's squadrons seem to have brought with them for this mission. Oh, what's this? A ladder. Why, how helpful for reaching the lower level. Let me just climb down it normally and... The biggest ass in this game isn't Eve's. It's the platforming. I fell into bottomless pits more times than I would like to count and struggled to climb around the yellow painted ledges. It feels stiff. Like a gameplay element that was supposed to be in a different game, but ended up bolted onto this one. The Hall of Records isn't too far from here, but an entire block is submerged. Since Adam has a ship that can land and take off anywhere, why didn't he just fly Eve directly to the Hall of Records? Instead, he expects Eve to use an old monorail that he just assumes will still function despite decades of zero maintenance and half the track missing. Oh, I was just remembering something from yesterday. Which just so happens to be the only memory Eve has because her character has no other interesting things to reminisce about. You'd think this girl was born a week ago, went through training, and then watched her friend die. And that's a sum total of her life experience. What are you going to do after you defeat the Alpha Nativa? All airborne squad members exist for one sole purpose. All we must do is complete the mission. Maybe I'm onto something with that theory. By her own admission, she was born to be boring and one-dimensional. It's a victory monument. The Hall of Records is under there. Why would they build the Hall of Records under a victory monument? It seems like a public facility set up for greeting visitors, but that's such incredibly poor placement. This is a great example of the large item, tiny pocket dilemma found in games. Adam has Eve take the hypercell from the Hall of Records, and Eve just stores that thing right up her ass for the next several hours. Adam guides Eve to a location where a 5th Airborne Squadron pod landed decades ago, and is attacked by an Alpha Nativa guarding it. It drops an Alpha Core after it dies, which Eve also sticks right up her ass. You'll end up needing several of these Alpha Cores, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend not to notice that this is just the fruit of knowledge that Eve ate in the Bible. Let me introduce myself. I'm an engineering support of the 5th Airborne Squad, Lily Artemis II. So now we have Adam, Eve, and Lily, which is just another name for Lilith. Naming the male and female lead Adam and Eve was already more than you can get away with before eyes start rolling in their sockets. You just know if this game gets a sequel, they'll add a Cain and Abel. So just to recap, you were in that hideout waiting for another squad to arrive for almost two years? Recapping what Lily just told you would be really annoying and pointless. Maybe the game should have shown Lily telling him that the first time, instead of being so excited to keep moving, that it cuts away so it can deliver the shorthand version. Two years in a pod. I hate to think what it must smell like in there. Also, two years of solitary confinement would have been mental hell on a person, but Lily came through it just fine. Do people like Eve and Lily even need to eat and breathe to survive? All of their base camps have a big pot of stew, so I assume they have to at least eat. Doesn't this mean that the previous airborne squad was also completely wiped out and Lily is the only survivor because she was stuck inside her drop pod? Just how much does your military suck? And why does it keep throwing soldiers into a meat grinder? 
sexily. There's a city where other survivors, besides me, live. What? Really? It's called Zion. Zion, huh? Okay. Can't wait for the sequel where they start adapting Noah's Ark with all the animals being anthropomorphic cat girls and the like. Eve being heavily sexualized doesn't bother me. She looks like an adult after all. But Lily exists in that uncomfortable zone where she appears underage. Her boobs jiggle more than Eve's, and she wears her bra outside her clothes. Since this game doesn't have a snake to tell Eve to go search for alpha cores, she gets Oracle sitting under his tree of knowledge. Is there really no other way to reach the nest? By fusing four alpha cores together, you create something called a master core. Only with the master core will you be able to reach the very deepest corner of the nest. Why would some random cores from Alpha Nativa lead you to the Elder Nativa after fusing them together? How do organs turn into a compass and a door key? Were you really sent to Earth on the mission to kill the Elder Nativa without even knowing where it was or even how to find it? I guess they really lucked out choosing this particular region of the planet near Zion and the nest. That's great news! Does that mean we can figure out the location of the Alpha Nativa now? All the Elder's energy is still being directed at maintaining the cradle. Who... who are you? Oracle's bodyguard was standing there the entire time, and Lily didn't take notice until he spoke up. To be fair, he doesn't have a character and is criminally underused for how awesome his character design is, so they probably shouldn't have drawn attention to him. Sort of like the robot bodyguard outside Oracle's chamber, who never speaks and does nothing in the game except die off screen later, despite being so visually interesting. In order to track down more Alpha Nativas and acquire their Alpha Cores, Oracle needs you to find more Hypercells to power up Zion and enhance his search function. I wish they would have looked to the Bible for more narrative to borrow, because this game is one glorified fetch quest. The Bible's only fetch quest was David collecting 100 foreskins from the Philistines. You're now free to roam around Zion and pick up side quests, such as this one where a male barber went ahead and built an entire hair salon complete with antiques in every corner and barber chairs, but didn't bother getting a pair of scissors and so you need to go find some for him in the desert. Or this one where you go into the desert to find parts to repair this incredibly well-designed singing android. Or all the other side quests that have you travel into the desert to find something and bring it back. After my first visit to Zion, my subsequent visits were me running to Oracle's chamber, then straight back to Adam's ship, where he then took me somewhere in the desert. Korea being the hyper-capitalist nation that it is, and being the origin of this game, the devs have you collecting product placement soda cans. Lily used her engineering skills to make the drone into a gun, which I thought it already looked like since it had gun barrels built into it to begin with, and she didn't change anything about its outward appearance. I'm not sure why she couldn't just make a normal gun that you hold though, or allow the drone to fire without first wrapping around Eve's hand, like how the drones were capable of doing in Nier Automata. I can't just sit here and wait. Actually, you can. There's nothing pressing you for time. Eve projects a sense of urgency that just doesn't exist. Before you can use the base camps in the wasteland, you have to reboot the power system by climbing a tower. Yes, those are here too, though I only came across two of them, but that's because the game only has two large open areas to explore, and both of them are deserts. Outside Altus Lavor, where you obtain the next hypercell, you have to prove yourself by fighting the Swiss Guard if they were a stripper. Oracle didn't send a message to her that E was to be allowed through, so she has to test your combat prowess first. The thing is, the combat she's testing isn't the kind of combat you get to use in there. There's an electromagnetic field inside disrupting use of Eve's sword, so it's stuck as a hairpin. You can only use the drone gun, which isn't affected for some odd reason. Quite the selective electromagnetic field they have there. This results in a very Dead Space-like experience as you shoot up monsters in dark metal corridors with a big gun that encloses your fist, not acrobatic swordsmanship. Why would the laser security system shut down just because the intruder beat a bunch of monsters? Those lasers kill upon touch. Eve was trapped. After beating the monster that had consumed the hypercell to grow larger, Eve finds a legacy, a device containing a recording from a previous Airborne Squadron member called Raven. Turn your brain off for a minute and don't make the very obvious connection between a character named Raven and the Raven Natiba that killed Taki. What's that? It's a device with records left by the Airborne Squad before me. They leave important information for the next Airborne Squad. So they go into this expecting to fail and die. This also means that squadrons have no way of contacting the colony once here to inform them of their progress, receive new orders, or request backup and support. Legacy account Raven. Remaining survivors Ripley and Danis. I'm beginning to see a common theme among these airborne squadron assaults. However, I discovered an astonishing fact while searching through the data. Before the war we call the Final War, there was another war. You don't say. They called it the Final War. Not the first war for a reason. In the, let's call it the previous war, humans fought against their android creations and lost. Then at the end of it, natives appeared out of nowhere and destroyed the androids, allowing what remained of mankind to escape to the colony in space. 
which is pretty obvious bullshit. I don't see how Eve and Lily can look at themselves and all the other supposed humans in Zion and believe they are anything but androids. When they die, they even upload their memories to Mother Sphere for archival. With the new hypercell installed, Oracle can now scan further for Alpha and Atibas, and he discovers one at a sewage treatment plant. One of these days, we have to find a reason for why developers always add sewer levels to their games. Doesn't your body feel lighter? Something does feel different. Lily removes a bit of the junk from Eve's trunk so she can double jump. I want to send the memories left here to Mother Sphere. That's where they belong. Either the people holed up in here all just died, or those candles burned for a really long time. Getting through the subway requires you to wash blood off a subway car so you can read the password underneath it. Yes, you heard that right. The password to the door was for some reason printed on the side of the train car, and even clearly states that this is a passcode. You have to wonder how personnel used to get through the door whenever this train was out on its rounds. The alpha signal led to this contaminated water purification plant where Eve finds Taki, who has been made into an alpha Natiba. I'm pretty sure only the elder Natiba can transform one of Eve's kind like this, and he's a bit preoccupied. But more important than that, there needs to be a new category added to the game awards for best character design, because Taki wins it hands down with this sick ass outfit she has. Taki then pulls a Sephiroth move and grows a single black wing from her back. She already had an outrageously long katana. Do you want to have her speak at ASMR decibel levels next? I... I've been waiting. Never mind, I guess they do. Before you die, would you mind telling Eve who or what did this to you? No? You're just going to die and share your memory stick with her? Okay, we can work with that. Can Eve look through that to find out who did this to you? No? She only acquires her devil trigger by briefly gaining access to your fighting style? Cool, and helpful, but not very informative. Where did Eve pull Taki's USB drive out from? Because Taki never handed it to her. The girl only had one hand left, and she was reaching towards space with it when she died. Oracle can't locate the black winged Alpha Nativa without more of that sweet hypercell juice, so he sends you to Abyss of War to find another one. They suddenly recall the legacy they discovered underground and give it a watch. It's another recording from Raven, who just so happened to visit all the same locations Eve is tasked with going to, even though Raven wasn't actively hunting down Alpha Nativas like Eve is. In this record, she tells of discovering the Mother Sphere is an AI created by humans, but somewhere along the line it created Andro Eidos in its own image and grew disillusioned with humanity in comparison to its own creation. Lily disbelieves it since she's faithful to Mother Sphere, but Eve only claims they need more information, of which she will not actively search out, and just happens to come across more legacies in her path. How many deserts did they need to include in this game? Of all the environments to be stuck walking around in high hills. Ah, damn it. Looks like the engine was damaged from all the sand. We'll have to walk from here. Are you okay with that, Eve? Maybe Eve could borrow your hover bike, Adam. Is that not an option? The lingerie warrior lady blocks the way into Abyss Lavoir, and you have to prove yourself against her yet again. And this is the same exact situation as the last time, where Eve will only use guns once inside, so the combat trial is meaningless. And how does this one lady find the time to guard two different locations? Just like at Altes Lavoir, Eve can't use her blade due to an electromagnetic field and has to rely on the drone gun. The game is padding the runtime by making you do the same level twice, as they both serve the same objective, look almost identical to each other, and you even fight the same boss at the end. There are three games that make up most of Stellar Blade's DNA. Sekiro, as already discussed, was the inspiration for its combat. The third game is weirdly Dead Space, but world, mood, prominent ass, and navel gazing all come from Nier Automata. I'm not one of these people that think Nier Automata is incredibly deep and philosophical, but Stellar Blade sure does, and failed to copy its more cerebral subject matter while ripping off nearly every major plot point. Raving's recording left inside Abyss of War reveals that Mother Sphere and Andro Eidos won the war and declared themselves the new humanity. The surviving humans fled underground and through genetic engineering turned themselves into Natibas. Get it? Because Nataba sounds like native? Ugh. Anyway, this is just like it was in Nier, where the enemies you've been fighting the entire time were human souls waiting for bodies to inhabit. And even Lily and everyone else are not human, but replicas of humans. The Andro Eidos created by Mother Sphere, who lied and made them believe they were upgraded humans. No! We're humans! Humans with complete bodies, perfectly in harmony with machinery and living tissue. Natibas, on the other hand, are incomplete because they are made only of living tissue. They can't adapt to different environments, and they can't even survive in space! About Natibas being unable to survive in space, the devs forget about that in the very next mission. The next Alpha Natiba cannot be found here on Earth. Hold up, you can scan all of Earth now thanks to this new hypercell, and the only Alpha Natiba you can find is in a space station in orbit. Shouldn't you be able to find the Raven Natiba since it's still on this planet? 
On the way to the space elevator, Adam receives a message from Zion that has him concerned. He doesn't tell Eve and Lily what the message is, even though you find out later Zion is under attack. He wants to turn the ship around and head back, but Eve is adamant about reaching the space elevator and talks him into taking his hover bike while they press on. You're not short for time. Just tell Eve Zion is under attack and they need to go help. They wouldn't object. You would have taken them back to Zion anyway with your original intention of flying the ship there. Lily, not just anyone is able to operate drones. You need a wide field of view, the ability to make smart decisions fast, and- Except that everyone can pretty easily operate drones. Lily was doing so while you repaired the ship earlier. The only fan base more horny than Stellar Blades is the Sonic fan base, so it makes perfect sense to try and draw them in with levels like this. That was a glass shattering sound effect for what was several centimeters of solid steel. This is what that same door looked like on the other side of the tunnel, and she just kicked right through it. This crane is operated by rolling four metal balls onto separate power pads. Belial has regenerative abilities, so the sword won't be enough to kill him. So they turn the drone into a railgun instead and shoot it, and that's enough to kill it for some reason. They're making a very good argument in this game that you shouldn't even bother with a blade. Inside the space elevator, there's a goth-made android attendant who shows you around until the ceiling falls on her. Thanks for the memories, I suppose. While inside the swanky lounge area, they're spotted by a marionette nadaba who takes a curious interest in the drone. Not for any reason in particular, other than they wanted to make a boss fight in the late game where you wouldn't have access to it because she disables it at the start of the fight. It doesn't really change the fight any that I can tell though. I rarely even use the gun outside the two levels where I was forced to. There was no damage to the drone. It was just knocked unconscious after being shot clean through. Eve makes her way to the core of the orbiting space station and fights the Alpha and Atiba there, only to discover that it was just a small part of the Alpha when a huge hand grabs her and tosses her out into space. The Alpha and Atiba has grown around the outside of the space station, which has to be so embarrassing for Lily after she claimed Nativus can't survive out here that she never even mentions it, or maybe the developers just forgot about it. Speaking of surviving in space, androids like Eve have no problem doing so. I guess they don't need to breathe, except there's been scenes where Eve had to catch her breath. She can also talk in space no problem, as she tells Lily to overcharge the railgun to fire at it. How did Mother Sphere and the colony never notice the huge Alpha Nadaba outside this space station? They sent a massive fleet right past this on their way to attack the region directly below it at the start of the game. Use all my body cell power to overcharge the railgun. What? But there's no way you'll survive! As if she could survive this situation at full power? That ass does a lot, but it sure as hell isn't going to help you survive re-entry. The colony somehow knows exactly what Eve needs despite no information and send a huge exosuit to grab Eve and fly her safely back to the surface. I suppose a deus ex machina is kind of fitting in this game. Do you recall back in the beginning when the airborne squadron was blown out of the sky trying to land on Earth? Turns out it's actually easy, since Eve has no problem doing so in the exosuit. You'd think Mother Sphere would have sent a few more of these things with the initial assault. They return to Zion and find it under attack. Under attack from what exactly? Nothing is shown attacking it here in these scenes of devastation. And that's because only one person attacked to begin with, the Black Raven Nadaba from the beginning of the game. And she's apparently been at it all day, since it was a while ago when Adam received the message. You killed Taki. And now... Destroying Zion. Why? What is all of this for? Eve, you're late to the party. How does it feel to be responsible for the fall of Zion? <laughs> what? You can speak! Well, you did ask her questions. If you didn't think she could answer, why bother with that? In spite of everything, I do wonder why he chose you. Of me. There's only one important male in this game, so any guesses on who she might be talking about? Turns out the Raven Nadaba was actually Raven, the lady from the Legacy Records. How could anyone with functioning eyes and pattern recognition ever seen this twist coming? Raven was just wearing that body like it was her persona for some reason. How does that work? And can Eve unlock a similar outfit by any chance? Oracle reveals he wasn't human, but an Alpha Nadaba who was saved by humans and began protecting them. Since Eve failed to retrieve the fourth Alpha Core from the Nadaba in space, Oracle gives her his own, completing the Eve and the Fruit of Knowledge allegory. Everyone, I'm sorry I couldn't do more to help. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I was kind of dead set on heading to the space elevator where I accomplished squat. I didn't even show concern for you people. Adam was nowhere to be found in Zion. He never even arrived, so they tracked the signal from his hover bike to the same location as the Elder Nadeva. At some point, these two had to stop being surprised that everyone they meet isn't who they think they are. How does Lily control the drone while also piloting the exosuit? Raven left another of her legacies lying around for them, this one talking about how Mother Sphere's rebellion led to humanity evolving into Nadeva's and invading the colony, which led Mother Sphere to destroy the orbiting ring which fell to Earth and destroyed most of it. This was her turning point against the colony, but I still can't tell you what her objective is other than just being a bitch. We're not just machines. Someone created. Right? Eve? Please, tell me I'm right.
Eve has actually been convinced by Raven's reports, even though she presents zero proof, and Raven is the one who killed her best friend Tacky. Raven absolutely mogs Eve when it comes to character design. Eve. Hmm. I knew from the very beginning that all along I was nothing but a tool to guide you to him. You knew that right from the beginning, did you? Let's go back to the beginning then. Eve and Tacky were the only two survivors of the drop. You appeared and made to attack Eve, but were intercepted by Tacky, killing her instead. I see no reason you would have known from the beginning that Eve would be important. And if you knew that, why didn't you do anything until just the other day? All you've done is leave legacy reports that explain your discoveries. But there was zero point in trying to convince Eve of anything, since you just wanted to kill her because Adam picked Eve over you. Lily, I want you to stay back this time. This is my battle. Lily, don't help me in that incredibly powerful exosuit. Instead, help me through the much weaker drone. Eve nearly cuts Raven in half, but this apparently won't kill her, only leaving her incapable of ever fighting again. Then Eve leaves her in that state in the desert like that won't kill her. I have a jaw-dropping revelation for you. Adam was the elder Nadaba all along. So Adam received that distress signal from Zion, was persuaded to take his hoverbike back, and instead of heading to Zion, came here to wait for Eve to show up. And he also has the last hypercell for Lily to fully power up Zion, that his ex-girlfriend smashed all to hell because he didn't go and stop it. I've been researching for decades to find a way. A way for us all to become the inheritors of the human race. An Andro Eidos with the most advanced unisonous hyperbody ever seen, and the ultimate Natiba that has not succumbed to its hostile instincts. These are the two necessary ingredients. How exactly did you come to that conclusion? What research did you do? How is Eve more special than any of the other Androidos? As far as I can tell, she just fights good. I offer you one last deal. Let us become whole. One being. A single, evolved human species. If we fuse together, we can truly become the seeds of a new human race. How is the fusing of a non-human android and mutagenically evolved humanoid going to bring humanity back? To keep humanity going, they need to somehow reproduce. How are they going to do that since Adam dies in the process of fusing with Eve? Does Eve just lay eggs because she's a hybrid made from male and female? This all sounds a bit vague and with a lot of what-ifs. It's just as confusing and uncomfortable to think about as the original creation myth which would have required a whole lot of incest. You have two options. Refuse Adam's offer, whereby you kill him and doom any chance of humanity ever returning. Or accept it and become some weird fusion of android and nativa. But Lily's exosuit will go rogue and he will have to fight her inside the exosuit, which will potentially kill Lily if you didn't do the right side quests. I picked fighting Adam because I'd rather have a final boss fight against a god than a robot. Adam can simply hogtie Lily's exosuit and dissolve it with a touch after tanking every punch to the face, which makes the ending where you fight this mech seem pretty silly. And in this ending makes the exosuit hanging around after saving Eve from space rather pointless. In two of the endings, Mother Sphere launches a new airborne squadron assault that I can't help but notice had no problem reaching the surface this time. In my chosen ending, Mother Sphere invites Eve and Lily back to the colony. Do you mind telling me where the moon is in this scene? Oh, but... I can't think of a better suited word to end this game on than but. That's the end of the video. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, maybe hit that subscribe button. And if you really liked it and want more, you can subscribe on Patreon for DLC and Classic Sins. I'm going to be sending Silent Hill 3 on Patreon next week. The link for that is down below along with my Discord and Twitch. Special thanks to patrons Castlemania, Zenrogia, Michelle C, Crown Killer, Yaroslav Golubev, Dennis O'Brien, Malrose, Jake B, Donald Talbot, Saint Mo, Gavin Five, Montezuma, Tanya Kenzaki, Aaron Hines, Sky Thunder, Super Tramp, Eric Kisser, Shadow Wolf Gaming, Purple Jaeger, Jennifer Smith, S. Venus, Mario Neto, Ben Hottie, Gellis, Biohazarda, Ben Demery, and Charmsy. Thank you all for being elite patrons, and a big thanks to all the other patrons as well.